Hi, I'm Dr. Sam Sunshine, and welcome to an educational video. I'm recording from OC Sports and Wellness, which is a direct primary care practice in Orange County, California. And today we're going to be talking about antibiotic use for the common cold and also a little bit about antibiotic resistance. So this is a common request I get from patients and have for the past 30 years is that patients want a quick fix for the common cold. And I'll talk a little bit about what differentiates a common cold from maybe a, a more severe bacterial infection, what you can do to treat a common cold, and then really being cautious about just taking an antibiotic willy-nilly. So again, this is a video that's for you to help educate you about the common cold. So if you think you're coming down with a sore throat, you get sinus congestion, you know, what are your options? And what are the things you want to do? And what are the things you don't want to do? And one of the things you don't want to do is take an antibiotic. And I'll explain why. So let me share my screen. And again, thank you for being here. And thank you for listening in on this. I really, I really appreciate it. Um, I do love putting these talks together. It is really a joy for me. So again, the, the title of this talk is antibiotics for upper respiratory infections, to take or not to take? That is the question. So when we look at, you know, what are antibiotics? Most people think of them as this miracle cure. I mean, I have just been um, almost ashamed uh, at how the medical profession, when I'm talking about the medical profession, the colleagues that I've worked with, um, or the patients I see after they've been treated somewhere else, locally uh, for a common cold, it, um, it's shocking how we've come to perceive the antibiotic as a cure-all for almost anything. Uh, some people are prescribing it for headaches or a sinus headache, which most of the time is probably more of a migraine than a uh, infection. And so we tend to err on prescribing a, medic a prescription antibiotic um, when we're not sure. So there's a lot of uncertainty among physicians and that's just, that's a problem. We need to be more accurate in our diagnosis. So what is an antibiotic? It's a prescription, typically, in, in the United States. Other countries, you can get antibiotics without a prescription. And uh, one country in particular is Mexico. So a lot of people go to Mexico and they come back, they pick up a couple z packs and have them. So next time they get a cold, they'll pop a z pack. Um, so antibiotics are prescription medication or drug, it's designed to kill bacteria. And they stop bacteria basically from multiplying. So bacteria get into our body, usually through our nose or our throat, um, and, and start to replicate. Um, antibiotics do not treat viral infections or fungal infections, and that's really important. So they treat bacterial infections. That's how they get the term antibiotic. They treat bacteria. Excuse me, antibacterial. Well, not antibiotic. They treat bacterial infections. Okay, and they're specific. Each antibiotic is really specific for a particular type of bacteria. So not every antibiotic treats all bacteria. There's thousands of different bacteria. Oftentimes, that's why we like to culture, uh, like a wound. If you've got an infection that can be cultured we can identify the bacteria and then use a specific antibiotic to treat that specific type of bacteria. So what is the prevalence of upper respiratory infections in the United States? Um, the United States annually um, will treat about a billion colds and 200 million times a uh, prescription will be given for an antibiotic unnecessarily for a sinus infection and about 200 million unnecessary prescriptions will be given or written for every year for an acute bronchitis. That's a cold. Again, some people, and I'll go into what are some of the common symptoms of, of a cold and then how you might differentiate that from a, a bacterial infection because there is some overlap. So it's not super clear cut, but generally we have a pretty good idea of being accurate most of the time, the vast majority of the time. Um, and what viruses do, and they're the primary cause of uh, the, the common cold, is they inflame the lining of our upper airway, our nose, our throat. 
um, our trachea, and that's why it gives us those symptoms, which I'll go into a little more detail. So again, common colds, they're very common. That's how they got their name, and they're caused by viruses, and there are over 200 different viruses that can cause the common cold. And I like this picture of this woman, and this is classic. You'll get up, and maybe it's mild symptoms. The next day, you're in bed, hard to get up, you're fatigued, tired, got the Kleenex out, you've got the cup of tea. Um, don't call your doctor and ask for an antibiotic. Most doctors will probably give you one over the phone, unfortunately, and I'll explain why that's a problem. And that's a major problem in our society, in the medical realm. So this is a, just a, a quote from Ogden Nash says, a family is a unit composed not only of children, but of men, women, an occasional animal and the common cold. And it's just part of our life. Again, we're just coming out of a pandemic, which was a more life-threatening condition. Common colds are not life-threatening. These viruses that, that cause the common cold, again, there are 200 different viruses that can cause a common cold, according to, to the literature, um, they are not life-threatening. They are no match for our sophisticated immune system. Maybe in certain people who have a depleted immune system or have an immune deficiency, the common cold can wreak havoc. But it is common, it's part of the family unit. So the question is, are we prescribing antibiotics, over-prescribing antibiotics? Some say yes. I say absolutely yes. What is the uh, Center for Disease Control or the CDC? Most of you know the CDC now because of the pandemic. We all are familiar with what the CDC does and they basically are you know, the, the Center for Disease Control in the United States out of Washington, DC. One in three antibiotic prescriptions are unnecessary. It's one in three, okay? Big deal. So you get somebody an antibiotic, so what? Well, we're gonna talk about the potential harms of antibiotics and why you don't wanna just take an antibiotic unnecessarily. And if you're one of those people that do, Good for you. Go continue to do it. Go down to Mexico, continue to take antibiotics without needing them, and, um, and hopefully you do fine. Again, 200 million unnecessary prescriptions are written annually for acute sinusitis. Again, this is sinus pressure, um, sinus congestion, usually within the first seven to 10 days of a cold. Um, these are viral. They don't require an antibiotic. 200 million unnecessary prescriptions are written for acute bronchitis. That's usually a cough. It might last two to four weeks. There is no study that's ever been published showing that for garden variety acute bronchitis, again, a cough that can last two to four weeks responds to an antibiotic, but everyone gets a prescription for an antibiotic, even though they're viral. And really, the virus has been treated. We're now dealing with the aftermath and just trying to heal the lining that's inflamed. And that's what the virus does to us. So it's, you know, that cough just perpetuates the cough. So we need to slow down the cough. And really, again, like I mentioned earlier, most doctors have diagnostic uncertainty about whether or not it's a cold or a, um, or a bacterial infection. Bacterial infections are pretty uncommon. I rarely see them. And I'll explain some of the caveats about when to think, hey, I could be dealing with a bacterial infection. And they're not something to mess around with. You do need an antibiotic for a bacterial infection. Um, oftentimes, doctors will, about 30% of the time, uh, we'll prescribe an antibiotic over the phone. And now with telemedicine, that's becoming the norm. Or uh, what are your symptoms? Oh, okay, you've been sneezing, coughing. Let me just give you a Z-pack. And uh, it's unfortunate, but I really think that that's the bane of our, our medical society in the world. This was a, um, a study published a couple of years ago out of the um, University of, of Michigan saying that one in four uh, antibiotic prescriptions were unnecessary. They did a retrospective chart review to see. And about um, a majority of those times, there was no even documented diagnosis for these patients in their, in their chart notes. Um, it's really sad. And then one in, in four of the patients received unnecessary antibiotics in 2016. Kind of a screwy slide, but anyway. So you can see in their calculation, it's about one in four. I think it's higher. Um, to 30%, if not higher than that. So again, this is kind of how I visualize um, the patient understanding of when an antibiotic is necessary, when a medication is necessary. And um, I'll be honest, as a doctor, it's a lot easier for me. If you come in to see me and you have, I feel awful, I have, I have fever, I have a headache, 
I'm coughing. It takes me less than a minute to get on my computer and type out a prescription to be sent to your pharmacy for you to start an antibiotic. And it is for me to explain why you don't need it and why it can be harmful. Most doctors take the easy way out because I've seen it for 30 years. I don't. I, and, and then I, I appreciate when patients say, thank you, Dr. Sunshine, because I, if I don't need to take an antibiotic, I don't want one. Um, but uh, most patients still argue with me about that antibiotics work because they've always been given one. And it is common for patients to say, why is she giving you one? Every doctor I've seen for the last 40 years always gives me an antibiotic when I have a cold. And that's an uphill battle. It's, uh, I feel like a salmon swimming upstream to try to explain to them. So this is why I put together this video so you can listen to this and hopefully <laughs> I don't come across as being too, um, too angry about this topic because it's near and dear to me. Um, but here's antibiotic expenditures by year in the United States looking at a five-year span. But in 2010, we were spending um, over $10 million in antibiotic, $10, $10 million. Uh, it's come down to 8,800. Uh, but over the past five years you know, or six, six years, we've spent an estimate of 55, almost $56 million. And that also includes all the plastic bottles with antibiotics that have to be disposed of that uh, is becoming a global, global health concern. I think it's important we understand that. So this is a slide, super complicated. If you're a patient and looking at this, I can imagine you're thinking, what the, why are you showing me this? But this is now patient you know, uh, setting and they really kind of try to break colds into three tiers. Uh, tier one is definitely need antibiotics. And this is one reason why you need an antibiotic. The top portion of the chart with those bar graphs, that's pediatric patients. The bottom one is adults, but you can see pretty similar. They kind of mirror each other. Um, and so for the, the absolute tier one where antibiotics are necessary is for the diagnosis of pneumonia. Pneumonia is actually a lower respiratory tract infection, um, whether it's viral or bacterial. Again, we tend to not mess around because it can be life-threatening if you don't treat it. So we tend to err on the side of caution by prescribing an antibiotic. And then we follow patients fairly closely if we diagnose them with pneumonia. But usually that's gonna be using our stethoscope, auscultating the lungs, listening to the lungs and listening for crackling sounds, usually high fever, shortness of breath, and coughing, usually a very productive cough, although not always. But what's interesting is this is during the flu season, and these are the people that received antibiotics. So again, majority of people, that 90% of people get it for antibiotics. But then when you look at tier two, and again, I apologize if I spent too much time on this, I think it's important though, but pharyngitis, which is throat pain, sinusitis, or otitis media, which is a red eardrum, when we look in the ear canal, we see the red eardrum, that's the Titus media. Most of these, again, are viral to begin with, but can evolve into bacterial infections. Pharyngitis generally is viral, but I'll explain later, strep throat is bacterial and you need antibiotics for strep throat. And I'll show you a picture of that. Um, but what they did is they swabbed all the patients with for influenza, because it was during cold and flu season and influenza is the flu. And what the dark green segment is, these are patients who tested positive for influenza. So that's that red arrow. These are these patients that tested positive for influenza. So we know it's a virus, it does not respond to back antibiotics because it's not bacterial, right? And they still got an antibiotic. And to me, that's mind boggling. Again, as, as clinicians, a lot of the times what I see in, with patients outside of my clinic is they get these antibiotics really unnecessarily. Um, so thank you for enduring that slide. I'll, I promise I won't show another bar graph for you during this talk. So this is a picture of Alexander Fleming, who in 1928 discovered the first antibiotic. So it hasn't quite been a century, but the advent of antibiotics have saved countless lives globally. It's one of the greatest discoveries of all time in terms of helping. Um, people overcome bacterial infections. Prior to 1928, if you got a staph infection, let's say by cutting yourself on the arm, 
it may spread and become a systemic infection, which we call sepsis, and you would die. Um, and there was no cure. There was nothing we can do to help a systemic bac bacterial infection. Um, and it was um, crazy. And it was almost diagnosed uh, serendipitously because um, he left a culture of, I think it was a, a strep culture, which he put on a plate, one of those auger plates and left it. And he had forgotten about it, came back and there was some mold that was growing on the plate. And he noticed where the mold was, it was inhibiting bacterial growth. And so it was actually a mold that became the first antibiotic called uh, penicillin, later penicillin G. So very fascinating, 1928. And when that got discovered, it took years. It took years. Now he was from the UK and the British government didn't want any, they had no interest in learning about this new discovery. And it was years later before someone was able to convince the government in the United States to take a look at this. And um, I think it was a lot of private financing to get um, the production of this, this first antibiotic developed. And it was remarkable in how it was saving lives for people who had a bacterial infection that was susceptible to penicillin, which is most of, the, most of these gram negative, again, not to get too technical, but only certain types of bacteria would respond, but a lot of those were skin infections, um, uh, throat infections, potentially pneumonia as well. There are some pneumonia, bacteria that cause pneumonia that can respond to penicillin. The, um, the mold that inhibited the bacterial growth was given the title antibiosis. And that's how we got the term antibiotic. But what's interesting is in 1940, we started to see drug resistance because these bacteria are clever and they developed a enzyme called penicillinase, and that would break down the penicillin. So they, they were, uh, these bugs are smart and they have what's called a uh, cell survival mechanism, just like humans do, just like flies do, brown worms do, mice do. Uh, we have cell survival mechanisms. So when we feel threatened, we figure out ways. So that took 12 years before we saw antibiotic resistance. Now, when we develop new antibiotics, we see, we see resistance within months and even sooner. So weeks to months, we'll see resistance. That's how quick these uh, bacteria can modify or mutate. So when we look at antibiotic resistance, no one really talks about this, except probably at the CDC and other labs that are working on developing antibiotics and bacterial infections, and certainly hospitals, because a lot of infections occur in hospitals and hospitalized patients. And that's a big problem, uh, despite really the, the really heroic efforts, efforts to keep things sterile. But um, it's one of the really, antibiotic resistance is going to be one of the biggest global health challenges that we face over the next 20 to 30 years. So pay attention. Um, and antibiotic resistance can affect anybody, a child or an adult. Um, it's not just elderly debilitated patients. But each year, 2.8 million people get an antibiotic resistant infection. That means there are no antibiotics that are available to treat that infection. And, um, and the, uh, one of the major, one of the, you know, the major, major driving forces of antibiotic resistance is the misuse of antibiotics. And that's not debatable. 35,000 people die each year from the drug resistant bacteria. And that's in the United States. That is not global, that's the United States. And we know that these antibiotic bacteria will kill more people than cancer and diabetes combined by 2050. So let me say that again. In again, 30 years, it's estimated that sepsis which used to affect us before the advent of penicillin back in 1928 when that was invented, that's now gonna be the leading cause of death. One of the leading causes is, is infection that we don't have any treatment for. Now, again, I don't wanna be bleak, but this is what the predictions are. I do think through artificial intelligence, we will be able to figure out uh, the development of newer um, antibiotics that outsmart these bacteria. And you think, how can these little organisms outsmart us? It, it's, it's remarkable. And that's how the, the pandemic starts because these viruses mutate and they become savvy and they know how to, uh, to, do, to do damage, unfortunately. 
So what causes antibiotic resistance? So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time about antibiotic resistance because I think it's important. If you're going to be consuming antibiotics, you know that that can potentially increase your risk of developing antibiotic resistance. It's not a foregone conclusion that if you take an antibiotic, now all of a sudden you're going to be susceptible to developing one of these antibiotic resistance Back, resistant bacteria, and then you're going to be one of the 35,000 people that die. No, people take antibiotics all the time. It's just you don't want to take them unnecessarily. So again, we know that bacteria mutate and that overprescribing antibiotics increases antibiotic resistance for the entire population. Um, also, patients not finishing their antibiotics. And this is also a big point that other people have talked about. And do we need to take a 10-day course of something if, it's, if our symptoms are improved in three days? Chances are we don't, but I'm not gonna tell you not to listen to your doctor. Again, it'll be another five or 10 or 20 years before we understand the duration of when to take an antibiotic. It's different depending on the condition. And oftentimes you don't need it, to, you don't need to take it as long as it's prescribed. But again, I'm recommending you follow the instruction of your doctor if you're giving an antibiotic. Uh, we over overuse uh, antibiotics in livestock. So this is cows, pigs, chickens. We inject them all with antibiotics so that we don't get herd infections. Um, and so uh, all livestock are getting massive doses of antibiotics. Um, we also have poor infection control in hospitals as, as much as we try and clinics too to keep things sanitized. It's an uphill battle. Um, and again, lack of new antibiotics being developed because the resistance happens so quick. We've got to come up with a different ideology on how this is going to work. So again, this picture to the right talks about, uh, you, let's say you have um, bacteria that we're treating with an antibiotic. It's going to kill the bacteria that are susceptible to the antibiotic, but you're going to have some bacteria that are not susceptible because maybe they're a different strain or they've mutated. And those are the ones that are now going to propagate and, and uh, continue to proliferate. And they're not going to be susceptible to that antibiotic anymore. So again, that happens readily. This is another sinking point, and that's that early life antibiotic exposure. And again, I'm reiterating what everyone else says. If you have a child under the age of two that needs an antibiotic, do not hesitate to take it. If the doctor is uncertain, go see another doctor. And why do I say that? Well, primarily because the microbiome of your intestines, which is a, you know, these trillion to hundred trillion bacteria, which are good bacteria. So I should have included the slide because some bacteria are good and they're commensal and they live with us and they help with digestion and making neurotransmitters and helping our support our immune system and making B vitamins, um, which are the healthy bugs in our intestines. They do all these wonderful things. Um, but then we have invasive um, bacteria that are not our friends and it can cause damage. That's why we take antibiotics. But if you have a child, no, let me step back. A child's gut microbiome develops during the first two to three years of life, and it's not fully colonized with all the different thousand strains of different bacteria until they're about two or three. If a child receives an antibiotic prior to them, it can wipe out certain strains of, ba of good bacteria that we need to help us with our immune system and fighting uh, infl inflammation. And what we see is early antibiotic use increases the risk of asthma, which is an inflammatory condition, eczema, which is an inflammatory condition of skin, allergies, even obesity and inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Things you don't, those are two autoimmune conditions you don't want. We also think asthma can have an autoimmune component to it as well. So again, be cautious. And again, this just shows you how it can affect our, our health by taking an antibiotic. Again, some of the causes of antibiotic resistance. So I just talked about that, so I went the wrong direction. So do antibiotics have side effects? Absolutely. You know, they can get, a, you can get a rash from antibiotics. Some people get dizziness, um, nausea. Women can get a yeast infection, a vaginal yeast infection. It can cause diarrhea. And this happens a lot. If I do prescribe an antibiotic, if you end up getting an antibiotic from me or somebody else, 
recommend, I recommend that you take a probiotic with that. And that's a capsule that contains healthy bacteria, usually lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, um, greater than three million count and more than five strains, preferably extracts. So again, this is from the CDC. It doesn't talk about how it wipes out your gut microbiome though. And some people are very susceptible to that. You know, they take an a course of antibiotics and they, some, some people just feel like they never fully recover. So when is an antibiotic necessary? There's a few instances. Again, for pneumonia, this is a picture of an x-ray on the top and that's uh, this segmental co consolidations, that white kind of wedge-shaped thing on the lungs. That requires antibiotics, no questions asked. Symptoms are usually fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Typically when I see people have a common cold, yeah, they might have a low grade fever and they can be coughing up a storm. A lot of times they're not short of breath. And when I listen to the lungs, it's clear. So I don't see a lot of cases of pneumonia, um, but sometimes I say that and then tomorrow I'll see two cases, but rarely uh, do I see more than one or two cases a year. But back when I was um, seeing high volume of patients, we would see about 1500 colds a year in our office. Um, and just a few cases of pneumonia. So in my patient population, pneumonia was pretty uncommon. Um, strep throat, pretty common in younger people and children, adolescents. And this picture on the, on the right, the bottom, this is a picture of inflamed tonsils, which are in the back of your throat. This requires antibiotics as well. And you can see those white patches, we call those exudates. So if you have those exudates, could be caused by mono, which is a viral infection, but uh, if you have tender lymph nodes, fever, and you get a swab, it shows it's strep, you wanna treat it with antibiotics. So that's not debatable either. And then bacterial science infections. This is, um, I think, misunderstood by most physicians. Um, but again, this is where you get tenderness in your sinuses that usually develops seven to 14 days after your cold starts. It does, bacterial infections don't start in the first day or two of a cold. So again, 200 million unnecessary prescriptions for acute sinusitis are prescribed every year in the United States. And that's really sad and it's really unfortunate. But usually it's people who say, you know, I had a cold, I started feeling better. And then all of a sudden I got fever and this pressure in my face, I leaned down and it just hurts. Or I got pain in my tooth. That's an indication for an antibiotic because you're probably developing a secondary bacterial infection. There's a cartoon that says, the bad news is there's no cure for the common cold. The good news is I think you have pneumonia because again, if you have a common cold, there's really not much you can do. But if you have pneumonia, antibiotics, okay? So hopefully that, that's clear. So how do you differentiate between a common cold and a bacterial infection. Again, the vast majority, I wanna say it's 95% of the time, it's 98% of the time it's gonna be viral. Um, antibiotics will not help, but like hoarseness, if you, lose your, if you lose your voice, generally that's viral. So if you have, if you, if you have hoarse voice, don't ask for the Z-Pack. Um, usually people have lower grade temperatures. You know, if you have pneumonia, usually you're, you have much higher temperature, higher fevers. You usually get mild symptoms with uh, cough and congestion, fatigue. Everyone gets fatigue. It's the body's way of slowing you down. Fevers is a way of fighting the virus. Our body heats itself up because viruses can't replicate when our body heats up. So I always say use caution. If you're going to take a pill to lower your, your temperature, it's actually given the virus an advantage. And studies are clear that if you take medications like Advil, Aleve, Tylenol to lower your temperature, your cold's gonna last longer. Choice is up to you. Uh, sneezing is kind of classic. You don't, bacterial infections don't cause sneezing. Could be allergies, could be a cold. And um, usually if you have mild symptoms that last seven to 10 days, which can be an eternity, um, usually it's viral. Uh, bacterial infections are progressive to get worse as time goes on. Um, and again, bacterial infections don't set up shop in that first week of symptoms. It usually takes longer. So hopefully that's clear. So next, the question is, okay, doc, I've got a cold. I'm not gonna ask you for an antibiotic, but what can I do? Well, the studies repeatedly show there's two things that really help. Rest 
and hydration. And each time I read a new article about, the, about a common cold, you know, new evidence shows, and I'm waiting with bated breath, and it says that rest and hydration have the biggest impact on shortening the duration of cold. So when I get sick, again, it's part of the family unit, common colds, we're all gonna get them. You shut it down. I don't exercise on those days. Um, I try to get more rest on those days. So instead of going to bed at nine o'clock, maybe I'll go to bed at seven o'clock because I know if I can get to bed and sleep more, I'm gonna get better faster. And that's what I found for myself. Another thing you could try is zinc lozenges. Not the tablets, but zinc lozenges, something you put in your mouth and you suck on. Zycam is one of dozens of examples. Zycam is a zinc lozenge. I'm not promoting that over all the others, but I like it because if you look at that red arrow, it says shortens colds. And what that means is it shortens the duration of cold symptoms. You want that. You got to start within the first 48 hours of a cold. After that, it's ineffective. But they can't put shortens colds unless there's clinical evidence to support that. And there is. Um, UMPCA, cold care, is on the right. And again, the arrow, if you look in the middle of the box, it says shortens duration and reduces severity of colds. Again, this is a geranium extract. It's great. Those are the two things I keep in my house. Again, I like UMCA, but I have just, um, I think, store brand for the zinc lozenges. It doesn't matter, really. It's the zinc gluconate, but that's coldies. A lot of the store brands um, do have zinc gluconate or they carry coldies. You do not need to be on Zycam. Um, vitamin C, again, all the studies I've ever read show there's no effect on using vitamin C for a common cold. But there are some people who have their heels dug in. And Linus Pauling was a big advocate of vitamin C. It is something that our body um, doesn't synthesize. We need to get it in citrus. Some people argue we're all vitamin D, vitamin C deficient, especially with the standard American diet. There are some studies showing that if you take vitamin C on a regular basis, you only need about 75 milligrams a day, it may reduce the incidence of, of colds. So you may get fewer colds if you take 60 to 75 milligrams of vitamin C on a daily basis. A thousand milligrams is probably the maximum you wanna take and it doesn't provide you with additional benefit. Um, we do offer IV vitamin C with a glutathione push in our office. I do feel that I, intravenous vitamin C, we can get it 20 times higher than you can get it from taking a tablet does help but there is no evidence in the literature that I can find. So if you know some, please send it to me that says that IV vitamin C um, hastens a cold. Um, there are some studies with acute asthma attacks that vitamin C intravenously can halt an asthma attack. So we use that in our office to help patients who have a cold, people who are planning to go on a long um, plane trip to the East Coast or overseas, I think, it's, I think it's reasonable to get an IV vitamin C a few days before you go. You can also get an IV vitamin C with a glutathione push for jet lag, to treat jet lag. All right, so we're at the end of the, this talk and it says, I, my cold is worse than yours because it's happening to me. And this is, uh, again, I get it. When you're sick, you don't feel well. That's... Let me say that again. When you get sick, you don't feel well. And when you have a common cold, that's being sick. And I get it, you don't feel well, but an antibiotic is not a valid option. So please heed this warning. So in my summary, don't simply take an antibiotic because you believe it will help, it won't. There are no studies supporting the use of antibiotics for colds, it doesn't work. You're using an antibiotic that treats bacterial infections to try to eradicate a viral infection. Won't work, doesn't work. Um, even if you said, well, gosh, when I take it right away, it always goes away. I'm sure if you didn't take it, it should go away anyway. And that's just the nature of colds. They don't linger. Um, again, avoid unnecessary use of antibiotics. Don't be part of that 30%. Question your doctor, because a lot of times they'll say, oh, you've got a cold, here's your antibiotic. And if you say, well, wait a minute, do I really need that? I just want to make sure I don't have pneumonia or is this a bacterial sinus infection? And they say, oh no, you don't have either of those and say, well, why do I need that antibiotic? Because chances are they'll say, no, you don't really need it. Maybe just take it in case because they want to make your visit as, as short as possible. That's the nature of our healthcare system. 
Bullet point number three is acute upper respiratory infections are mostly caused by viruses and antibiotics will not help. Use proven supplements like the ones I described, um, rest and hydration when you develop cold symptoms, simple as that. And antibiotics have side effects, they're not entirely safe and they can disrupt your microbiome. Again, taking a Z-Pack, according to some people, disrupts your microbiome for five years. So I want to thank you for, see if I can get you. This is where I, I struggle a little bit. Getting my, my, my mug back on. But anyway, I want to thank you for being here and listening to this talk on antibiotic resistance. And I want to thank you for listening, and that's the end of today's talk.